Boom, what's up everybody and welcome. Thanks for joining us, whether you are tuning in via the podcast or tuning in via YouTube. Um, we appreciate you for joining us. Um, the Roy boys are in attendance, I myself, and I am joined by my older, balder, smaller brother. <laughs> bald sexy. <laughs> hey, there's a lot of guys that, I mean, the rock's bald, so you can't really go wrong with that. You always, yeah. got, you always got the rock on your side, so. That's right, that's all you need. Um, so the world can be against you, but you got the rock, it's all good. Yeah, that's pretty much, that's my standard for everything. Like, if anything comes up, like, is the rock on it? <laughs> um, no, but anyway. Um, so welcome. We got another show for you here lined up. Um, this was one of the questions that we got um, when we had uh, the, the question that we put out for the last episode. There was a couple of questions that we had to, and this one caught my eye um, just because of the times that we're in right now. You know, we're all kind of stuck at home. Um, you know, not a lot of us have a lot of workout equipment at home, and some of us do. And if we do, if you're one of the fortunate ones that do have something at home, um, you have to get creative. Um, and, and myself included in that, like I have basically a barbell, some, some, you know, not a ton of weight. Um, so you gotta get creative and kind of stick to the basics. And that's probably where this question came from. This question was, was stay, I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but it said something along the lines of like, if you could only use five exercises for the rest of your life, like what would they be? Like if you had to create a program for the rest of your life and you could only choose five exercises to do, what would those be? So, you know, what, what are we going to choose to try and cover all of our bases within five exercises? So um, me and my brother each got our own list of five and um, we're going to, we, we don't know each other. So I'm sure there's going to be some overlap, but um, I don't know his five are, he doesn't know what my five are. Um, I'm thinking, do you want to, we can just, you want to list your five, then we'll list my five, and then we can kind of break them down one by one, because we'll probably have some overlapping ones. So we Yeah, can... just right, yeah, yeah, and then we can chime in. Let's, let's do it that. Let's try not to bore the shit out of people. Yeah, all right. Do um, you want to go your five first? Yeah, all right. So my top five exercises, I'm sure, are probably going to differ maybe a little bit from yours, um, but... And keep in mind that, you know, there are variations to these, but I was kind of just thinking off the top of my head as like if they were the only variation you could do is the traditional kind. Uh, number one, the push up. I mean, I mean, it doesn't get any more like standard than the push up. Um, uh, we'll go into the reasons behind it afterwards. Uh, the pull up, deadlift, reverse lunge. And sprints. Those are my five. That's good. We actually we have fair, a fair amount of variation on these. Um, although a caveat, I mean, I don't I don't consider this cheating. Um, I have sprint sprints on mine, but I don't have it as one of my five exercises because you don't need anything for that. I mean, I guess kind of it is cheating because a push up you don't need anything for either. But I mean, sprinting is, I mean, you're running. I mean, that's like whatever, but. Yeah, you know um, how many people don't do it though? <laughs> yeah, oh, I know, trust me. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was included in that for a long time, but um, okay. So you got the push up, pull up, deadlift, reverse lunge and sprint. My right. five, deadlift, number one. Squat, number two. I have a clean and press, number three. I got a Turkish get up number four. Ooh, TG. And then I got pull up or a chin up variation for number five. Um, so we both, we only have two, I guess you could say, that are similar. We have the deadlift and the pull up. Um, so I think a good way to kind of segue into our reasoning for it, before we get into the reasoning, um, at least for myself, I will kind of give a little bit of, um, you know, insight as to my criteria for choosing exercises. So when it comes to programming, um, you know, for yourself or for, for anybody, um, especially when we're looking longevity, like this has got to last me the rest of my life. So what we need to look at, at least for myself, like this is what I'm looking at. There's, I got a, a certain amount of bases that I want to cover. All right. 
So we need to cover strength and power. I want to keep my strength. I want to stay explosive and powerful. And you will get some uh, hypertrophy carryover from that stuff. I want to cover mobility. And you will get some stability work with mobility. If you're training through full ranges of motion, having to stabilize through those ranges of motion, then you're going to get some stability work through there. Um, and then overall, just body balance. Like we need to stay balanced to stay healthy. And then obviously cardiovascularly wise, I mean, you can incorporate, you know, if you're doing a set of 20 squats, back squats or something, then your cardiovascular is going to get up. You know, it's just not in the sense of, you're not going to really pick an exercise that's going to pick cardiovascular. So that's going to be more um, affected by how you incorporate the exercises. So really we're looking at strength and power. You'll get hypertrophy from that mobility and stability, and then just overall balance to the body. So those are kind of my criteria or my bases that I'm looking to cover when I choose my exercises. Um, did you want to add anything before we start kind of breaking each one of these down? No, I mean, I kind of did the same thing. I looked at body parts, but I also looked at my experience and, you know, me being eight years older than you, like I looked at exercises that I never really feel bad after doing and like imbalances that have been created. These exercises are things that I find either make me better and not feel as bad as other exercises. Um, I guess, yeah, I guess that's really the, the biggest thing is my own experience is the reason why I picked the ones that I picked. Okay. Um, all right. So let's go into the ones that we doubled up on first. So we both had the deadlift on there and that's obviously easy one to cover. I mean, if you're looking for overall strength development, I mean, the deadlift, you're really not going to find anything better than the deadlift. So like William said earlier too, like a basic conventional barbell deadlift, is the exercise, but if you want to, you know, depending how you want to interpret this question, it's a hypothetical question as it is. Obviously, if you have a barbell and you have weights and you can conventional deadlift, then you could also sumo deadlift. You could also straight leg deadlift. You could also do all these different variations, um, which are, you know, a ton more exercises. But like I said, it's a hypothetical situ uh, hypothetical question, hypothetical situation. So however you want to interpret it, but Basically, a barbell deadlift is, is number one on there for, for me, and it's on his list as well for basically just overall strength development and yeah. development of the posterior chain. I mean, you're not going to find a, a better exercise to develop the hamstrings, glutes, the back, and all everything um, on that part. So, so all right. uh, the pull-up, we both had the pull-up as well. Yeah. Um, so basically, the pull-up, I have that one on mine. When it comes to, like I said, we, I'm looking for overall balance on the body. So a good chest to bar pull up. I mean, it's really the only conventional pulling, upper body pulling exercise that I have on my list. Um, so that's why it's in on mine. Like I love rows. I love bent over rows and everything like that. But I'm just trying to see what I can get, you know, more bang for my buck. So um, I chose to pull up. Uh, and that's, I mean, that was my reasoning too. Um. I mean, also, I like the fact that you don't really need a lot. You can do a pull up pretty much anywhere. I mean, and you know, you, you look at it, you can do pull ups, you can do chin ups, you can do, you know, all different types of variations of them if you want to look into it like that. But also, a big reason, the, the biggest reason I chose the pull up over like a bent row was because a dead hang pull up, man, when you're dead hanging from, from that bar, you're getting phenomenal mobility into your shoulders. So if you can do a dead hang pull up where you are completely hanging from the bar and you have no tension or slack in the system, and then you can pull up from that, you're getting a ton of overhead and good shoulder mobility. Um, so that's, that was the ultimate deciding factor. Oh, I chose to pull up over any kind of row variation. So, so that's a good segue into why I chose the push up then. And we'll just fly right into that. So as you know, I had a shoulder issue that I dealt with for about a year. And uh, you know that you, you're the one that pointed it out to me. And that was when I was, I was not locking out my push-ups at the top. I would stop just short of lockout. Like to, to an untrained eye, like you would have been like, yo, he's got good push-ups. But obviously you have a more in-depth eye. And you're like, lock those out. And what I found was it was my serratus that was weak. Part of, that's part of it. And uh, I noticed coming back from that shoulder injury, push-ups was the first thing that I could do without any pain. And I started locking those out and slowly it started getting a lot better. So the push-up I chose 
one, yes, it works your chest, works your tries. You get some core work because you got to stabilize the core in that position, but also the shoulder stability that, um, you know, with that lockout position was huge. So people yeah. with shoulder problems. That's, that's the big thing. Like, I mean, everybody loves the bench press and everything, but you need to, you know, everybody wants to talk about balancing their pushes and their pulls, like balancing, you know, bench presses and pressing with rowing and, and upper back work, which is correct. But when you look at your presses too, you want to kind of balance out presses that allow your scaps to move and presses that don't. Like everybody likes to bench press. I mean, you're benching, whether it's a barbell or a dumbbell, which is, you know, seen as an easier bench press variation on the shoulders. Regardless, those scaps, your shoulder blades are pinned against that bench and they're not moving. Um, those scaps should be able to move with that upper arm. So push-ups are phenomenal because as you lower yourself down into a push-up, those scaps can come back and retract. And then as you press up and lock it out completely, those scaps will start to kind of rotate and separate across your upper back. And that movement is huge for overall shoulder health because that's where you're going to get that serratus anterior work in that, that lockout position, which helps with that upward rotation of your scapula, which is like super important. Um, and that's why people can't end up putting their arm over their head because a lot of that stuff is just all locked up. So. Yeah. And I, I mean, to this day, I'm fine now. Um, and that was a huge, huge, I mean, there were some other things I did too, but I think that was really a big one. Um, yeah. I mean, if, really you have, if you have shoulder problems, a lot of people just like to look at the glenohumeral joint, like the ball and socket, you know, basically the part of your shoulder, everybody can point at, you know, that upper arm. But a lot of times you got a shoulder problem, look at the scaps. If that scap can't move properly, that's going to be a, a big contributor to shoulder issues and you'll just feel it in the shoulder. So um, no, that's, that's good. I love push-ups. Um, that, that definitely, if I had a top 10 list, that would be on there and it'd be on there ahead of bench press. Um, so you had the push-up. Uh, my next one was the, uh, the clean and press and I put axle bar clean and press. Um, but, uh, I don't know if, if just for, for, I'm in a huge like grip mode right now. I've been, cause I have been limited on everything and uh, you know, just doing tons of stuff with the axle bar and my fat grips and stuff. Um, I love thick bar stuff. I, I'm, I'm, that's the silver lining of this whole quarantine and lockdown thing is that it's really kind of gotten me back to using a lot of thick bar stuff. And, um, but I put the cleaning press on there cause a it's, I got the, the with the the clean portion. I, I'm hitting that that explosive power aspect, um, and then the press portion of that. That's my upper body push. So I'm getting an overhead press, getting that overhead stability work, getting that upward rotation of my shoulder blades, allowing those guys to move. Um, so that's kind of a balancing out the the pull that I got with my pull ups, but it's also my upper body push and my explosive work all kind of wrapped up into one. So. Um, that's, that was my reasoning for the clean and press. So I love the clean and press and, uh, that's something I can finally do again. Um, but again, I guess you could look at it the same way. If you lock out, that's the other thing, locking out in that overhead position kind of does the same thing that shoulder stability. Oh yeah. Push -up yeah. Does. Um, but no, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna argue that. I love that. I used to do that all the time. When I was in the CrossFit, I mean, that was my number one movement. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at, like I said, we only have five exercises to use. So I'm trying to check as many boxes as possible with these exercises. So you know, outside of the conventional deadlifts and conventional squat, which are going to give you the most bang for your buck as far as strength goes, like everything else, I'm trying to check as many boxes as possible. So clean, clean, uh, clean and press, like you're taking a, a heavy weight from the floor, bringing it up to your shoulder, and then you got to press that shit overhead. Like there's a lot going on there. So um that was my third one. Um, well, your next one was reverse, reverse lunge. Um, I chose the reverse lunge because it's a lot less likely for somebody to mess up. Um, you know, a forward walking lunge, a lot of people like to overload the quad because they can't stay in their heel. They usually shift their weight more towards the front of their foot. And I can't tell you how many people I've seen tell me how much their quads start burning and lunges. Um, not that they won't get worked, but like your glutes need to be fired up in a lunge. And I feel a reverse lunge kind of just like naturally puts them in that position better. Um, and I'm a big fan of single leg work. Um, like my hips are uneven. 
And I find that when I squat, I tend to favor one side over the other. I never have that problem when I go single leg work because obviously they got to work, you know, independently of each other. And uh, just overall balance, I enjoy uh, using the single leg, which is why I chose a reverse lunge. So, I mean, anybody that's trained with me, um, like any of my, my athletes or, or members or clients, like I'm a lunge fiend. I love lunge. I've, I, I've accidentally loved lunges ever since I started lifting. Um, when I first got into lifting, I really jacked my ankles up bad between basketball and football. And they were just extremely stiff, um, not knowing, you know, anything. Like when I rolled my ankle or anything, I'd put ankle braces on them, which is basically just a soft cast. And basically you lose all ankle mobility. Um, so when I first got into lifting, like squatting was difficult for me. I couldn't squat because my ankles were so stiff. So the next best thing I did for my, for my legs was lunges. And I just did, I did a ton of lunges and I have loved lunges ever since. Um, and I was this close to putting it on my list. Um, but I was thinking I got the squat in there already for, for kind of like that lower body strength development and everything. And I thought that's, bringing me to my next one so that was the number four your fourth one was reverse lunge my fourth one was the turkish get up the turkish get up has a single leg element to it so um for those of you that don't know what a turkish get up is um just google it because i'm not really not gonna, I'm not gonna explain that one <laughs> on uh via the, the podcast um it's a very involved exercise um, basically you're, you're starting on your back and you have a weight in your hand and you have to stand completely up with the weight over your head and then go all the way back down um, but there is an instance in there where you're doing like a single leg glute bridge you're hitting you're standing up from a lunge position with that weight over your head um, so there was a single leg element to the Turkish get up and why I chose it but also that's my core exercise um you know ekg studies have shown that um or emg ekg <laughs> that's a heart monitor emg hey what the um, hell do i got to do with anything <laughs> has uh they've shown that there's no other exercise that activates your core more than turkish get up like all the core muscles not not just your six pack muscles the internal obliques the external obliques everything the intrinsic core muscles nothing activates those more than turkish get up so that's my big core movement um, it has the single leg component to it, but also to just the stability. I mean, you're, you're, you have to stabilize a weight in your shoulders in literally in every shoulder angle that you can think of. So yeah, they're uh, uh, they're a bitch. The, the, the man of steel workout where we had to do how many of those bad boys do we have to do? 120 of them. 120. Yeah. That was miserable. Grueling workout. Grueling, grueling. Shout out workout. to uh, Jim Jones and Henry Cavill. Yeah. Two and a half hour workout, absolutely insane. Um, but I, I, I mean, I have a love hate relationship with Turkish get up. So um, I love doing them heavy. I hate doing them light for lots of reps because <laughs> it, it's just it's 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 a more it's a mind it's a mind job. Yeah, and that's yeah that's another thing. I mean, I mean I've done we I've done we both have done plenty of workouts. We do a hundred of them. You do fifty with each hand, like fifteen pounds in each hand and just mentally it's just a mental grind so you know you can train the mind with those bad boys too which is always good so um that was my fourth one and you had sprints, sprints I put on there um and i put sprints on there because well i looked at it from the power kind of like your clean press i looked at it from a power um angle so you're getting your power your explosiveness in the in a sprint but also i put it on there for most of us you know, if not all of us in the fitness community still want to look good. And I don't think there's anything better that will lean you out and have you looking good than sprints. Look no further than Olympic sprinters. I mean, those guys, not only are they, they're jacked, but they're just shredded to the bone. So I, I don't think there's a better exercise to do if you want to like lean down real quick than incorporating sprints into your program. No, yeah. I, and then just from overall, just athletic development, if you just want to stay athletic um sprints are a must um i i neglected those for a long time um i started you know really going hard on them probably two years ago now and i haven't i, pro I haven't gone a single week without sprinting since um 
And honestly, like, you know, I've never read any information on this or anything like that, but like, I think if you're regularly sprinting, then like my hip flexors don't ever feel really tight anymore. Like I always just, feel better. I always feel better like two days after. Like oh, there's a little soreness, but then the day after, like my hips feel open. My, I I I really do feel a lot better. No, and I I do. I have seen the research that there is a component of um, when it comes to loosening a muscle. Like if you have a chronically tight muscle, um, a good test to see if it is loose is velocity of movement. So like if your hip flexor is super tight, you're not going to be able to kind of drive your, your, your foot down fast. Or, you know, if your glute or hamstring is really tight, you're not going to be able to drive your knee up towards your chest really fast. So like a good testament of muscle, like pliability is velocity and movement. So if you're sprinting effectively and you can maintain that and you can keep that, then more than likely you're going to be keeping good mobility for your hips and everything. So, um, no, I mean, I completely agree. I'm, I love sprints. Um, and because I, like I said, I kind of cheated, um, you know, not thinking in the sense of, you know, obviously you don't need anything for a push up, but just thinking sprinting just because it was a form of, you know, kind of locomotion, I guess. I, I didn't look at that as like a conventional exercise. So I kind of have it on like a, a little subcategory on my top five. Um, but it's also another reason why I didn't put reverse lunges on my list because if you look at single leg work, I mean, when you're running, when you're sprinting and it's not, I'm not talking about a fast jog, like few people know what a true all out sprint is like mark off 30 yards and just run like your life depended on it. Like if you are all out sprinting, your legs are hitting that ground with a ton of force. So you're getting a lot of power and strength development from sprinting. <laughs> Wow. That's why, like, I sh when I hear people tell me about, like, their gym workouts and the treadmill workouts, first of all, I can out-sprint a treadmill's speed. Um, you know, they, I'm talking the traditional treadmill, not like the um, – oh, yeah. that self Yeah. Self yeah. Uh, but the other thing, too, is, like, a lot of the sprint workouts that people will tell me about, they're like, oh, you should do this workout. Like, it's one-minute sprint. I'm like, have you ever tried to sprint full-on outside for one minute straight? It's not happening, man. Yeah. Like, not happening. No. Like, a one-minute sprint, you are going to be completely gassed, and your muscles are going to be failing about halfway through that. There is a – when it comes to sprinting, there is a huge difference between 90% and 100%. Yeah. And, and honestly, a lot of people – probably haven't even come close to 100% thinking they have but it's just from a lack of you know I, I say this a lot when it comes to just like even just pushing yourself in the in the gym like as far like on a rower or an aerodyne or anything like that like you have to work you have to really build up a, a kind of a foundation and really work in some higher percentages before you can even start to explore like 90 plus percent because um, you have to become really comfortable with being uncomfortable and yeah, you're not going to really sustain an all out sprint for one whole minute. Like that's going to be deadly. And that's the other thing with sprints too, is like how you can use them for different things. Like you said, you can use them for like a conditioning aspect. If you want to do an all out sprint for 15 to 20 seconds and then rest, you know, for 45 to 60 seconds and kind of do more of like a hit type of interval workout, or you can straight up cheat it like a, like a power development exercise sprint as fast as you possibly can for 30, 40 yards, and then take four to five minutes of rest and do that four or five times. Like you're going to get a tremendous, you know, training effect from that just from a power development standpoint, if you're trying to get fast. So I agree. Um, a ton, a ton you can do with sprints and that, that's why, you know, it's an all-star and a staple one. I haven't gone a week without doing them for two years now, but um, my last one squat. Yeah. Oh yeah. Squat. Yep. Uh, so I was looking at my list here. Yeah. The squat. I mean, I mean, do I really even have to explain this one? <laughs> I mean, it is like, I mean, it's although just... they say it's the king of exercises, but I, me personally, I'm a deadlifter before a squatter, but um, I, like I said earlier, like I avoided the squat for a long time just because it never felt good, never felt comfortable. Um, but when I actually did just finally mature, you know, learn more, 
found out kind of how to fix it um, and then started doing it regularly. Um, there is, there's a reason that it is, you know, the king of all exercises, you know, a deadlift, you know, Hey, it's on the floor. You try to pick it up. You can't get it. Then, you know, you just, you drop it or you just let go of the bar. I feel like for even like, even, you know, fitness gurus, like, and I'm not, I'm not talking like IG, I'm talking like legit trainers. I still hear some legitimate trainers that kind of dog the deadlift as far as like a risk versus reward ratio like thing. I think it's just, it's, and which I don't understand because I feel like you can screw up a squat back squat just as easy as you can screw up a deadlift. For um, sure. But the deadlift gets that bad, bad rap because picking up, if you're not in good form, your back rounds and people have back issues. And when in reality, when done right, it fixes a lot of back issues. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Um, it's, yeah, it's all context dependent. I mean, and everybody's got their own opinion. Um, you know, you got the Mike Boyles of the world who, you know, Mike Boyle, I've read a lot of his books and he's got a lot of great information and he's a huge time. Like he's big time trained tons of athletes, like super successful guy. And he doesn't do any, like he just started incorporating like hex bar deadlifts. Um, like, like I think for like the past year or so, but up until then, like he didn't have any one of his athletes do a, you know, a bilateral squat or bilateral deadlift. Everything was one leg. Like he completely just does not do like bilateral stance work. Um, and he just started doing like the hex bar deadlifts. But, um, so you have guys like that on that end. And then you have guys like, you know, obviously your power lifters and stuff. I think it's the only exercise you ever need to do. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't live on either end of the ex, uh, extreme end of the spectrum, but um, it's context dependent. I mean, it all depends who, who it's for, who you're training. Like I said, this is our top five list. We're given reasons why. And, um, you know, I've always done well with the deadlift and, you know, back to like what I was saying, like once I actually took the time to fix my squat and could do it properly and started loading it up, um, I, it, it complemented my deadlift. Um, and, and they both just, you know, worked up together and got a lot stronger at the same time. So, um, you know, they say, they say the squat's king of all exercises. And, you know, ultimately I'd have to agree. Cause like I said, you know, with a deadlift, if you can't pick it up, you just let go. And it's like no big deal, but you got a lot of weight on your back and you're going down. Like it's, it's scary, man. It's definitely the, 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 the macho lift because it's either coming up or you're going down with it. Yeah, that's right. Like you're going down with it and you're either coming up or you're not like, and it's and not fun getting pinned uh, under. A you know how many times I've seen, I've seen a lot of dudes eat, eat shit on a squat, man. I remember oh. Clarkston powerhouse, this kid, first of all, I'm watching his, his squat forms terrible. And this dude loads up. And I say kid, he's probably like 20. Um, not really big, but I mean, he wasn't small either. He puts 405 on there. And I'm like, dude, there's no way. And I'm just watching this train wreck happen. Yeah. And he loads it up, walks it back, and he goes to start go down. And backwards he goes. He goes back, smacks his head off the bar. Ooh. The biggest, loudest. Oh, man. Yeah, and he got up bad. like it was like no big deal. I mean, he was embarrassed for sure. Oh, yeah, there's there's no not being embarrassed with that. But um, the worst – the worst squat fell ever. So I won't say his name, but um, he was he was getting up there. I think he was maybe at like 385 or so. Um, and he had a belt on. You know, I, I'm not a big belt guy. I've never – I mean, I think I used the belt like the first year I ever lifted and haven't touched one since. Um, but he, he had a belt on, and he's going for it as a back squat. And went down, it was coming up, knew he wasn't going to get it, so he tried to dump it back. He, he like pushed it off the back of his shoulders and as it was coming down it caught the lip of his belt and in the the bar yanked him down because it landed on his belt like uh, uh, over his lower back and he fell backwards and like like he did like a back breaker on the barbell <laughs> like I was like oh my gosh like that's about as as dangerous of a fail as you could probably have with, with a back squat that's um, Scary, man. I've seen the, I've seen the somersaults where they have it on their back. 
they're coming up and like their ass goes up, but their head doesn't. And they just completely nosedive. Like and then yeah. I think it happened to you. Like the other thing that happens in the squat too, is you get young kids or people not paying attention and they start unloading from one side. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so that bar flips, man. I've seen that bar almost, uh, I'm sure he won't give a shit if he hears it, but Kyle Rice, some kid was doing that next to him and that bar flew over and it hit him, man. I and mean, Kyle's like, 350 like he's a big dude so yeah. like it, it didn't hit him in the head but like i mean that could kill you oh yeah that mess you up i had oh, that exercise it's only the squat where you see that happen yeah that happened to me this year a kid was doing it at the gym took too much off and the uh the bar came it came down and landed on my foot <laughs> i i was there when that happened <laughs> yeah, i heard like hell um yeah, man, squat. I mean, it's – yeah, we're kind of going off on a tangent here. But squat, yeah, yeah. squat man, it, it's the reason that it's it's got the the folklore behind it, man, because it's uh, – it says – it's and that's the thing I like about it too is, like, you'll have the people that will badmouth it and say that it doesn't work for them. But, like, the squat probably more than any other exercise is the one exercise where you will get – I mean, this goes obviously for all training – but I think it, it epitomizes the squat more than any other movement is you will get out of it what you put into it. Like if you've ever done a true 20 rep set, 20 rep max back squats, like that's brutal. I mean, super squats. There's a whole book. There's an entire book published about 20 rep max back squats and how insane they are. So that just goes to show you, um, you know, if it's a true 20 rep max, then it is, awful so yeah um so that's our top five there you go and like i said my i had sprints as kind of like my cheat you know subcategory because it doesn't use any equipment but uh but no that 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 i like those questions i kind of have like a love-hate relationship with questions like this because like why am i gonna only have to use five exercises but also well, like, like makes you think in this industry too, though, like, I mean, that's, that's what goes with, like, there are people that legitimately make a living on other people by coming up with these niche things and saying like, oh, my program's the best and blah, blah, blah. It's because I use these extra, there's like, this industry caters to that. Like, like oh, there's no, there's no one size fits all approach. No, for sure. Um, but uh, no, like I said, I mean, I love, I, I hate these questions in the sense where, I mean, I'm never going to be limited to just five exercises. Even in our current circumstance, I can do more than five exercises. But it also it makes you put your thinking cap on. Like, you know, what are my biggest bang for buck exercises? Like when I really like, you know, just looking at this list now, like I haven't done Turkish get-ups in a while. So, you know, I'll probably go back to the drawing board and start doing some more Turkish get-ups in, in this time off. But, um, you know, it just makes you think and, and, and kind of makes you look at your own programming from a different perspective. So, Anytime I can do that, it's a win-win. So, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't uh, – I don't think I had anything else to add on this one, but um, did you? Uh, that's it. Um, uh, did you say something? No. I mean, that's all I got. I was going to add something on, and this is completely random um, and totally off topic, kind of, but I heard it today, and I just wanted to pass this along, so I thought it would be valuable information. And it has to do with this whole freaking coronavirus thing that we're dealing with. But like, you know, a few weeks ago when I was at the store trying to find some soap and like there was no soap, like all the soap was gone. And the only soap that was on the, the shelves was Dawn dish soap. And I was like, well, so I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll just take this. And I bought some Dawn dish soap. I was like, you know, if it cleans my dishes. It's got to clean my hands. Right. And I, and you know, everyone's thinking, you know, antibacterial is the only soap to go with. But I, I found today, I heard uh, that it was actually on Mike Dolce's podcast. He had like a virus expert on there or whatever. Any soap that lathers, so any soap that'll, that'll like either foams when you come out or if you start to kind of, you know, rub it on your hands, it starts to bubble up and lather. Any soap that does that, it's going to like, I guess the, the outer shell of the virus is like 85% cholesterol. So like the Dawn dish soap that's, you know, good for oil oils and stuff on your pants like is awesome i guess it'll work just fine so i was like oh shit i'm glad i bought that then <laughs> so just thought i'd pass that out to anybody out there like if you're running low on soap and like you don't think you have any like you got some dish soap then you're in good shape so um anything that lathers just stay like i know there's syrup buys some of that soap that like 
has like freaking pieces of sand in it. It doesn't lather. It's just got like the hard stuff in it. You ever seen those? No. I like some all natural stuff. Yeah, I don't know. It's like it's got like it's for like moisturizing or something. But like I hate it because it just like it's like a, there's little rocks in it and like it just yeah. feels like I'm in my and, and it yeah. doesn't lather. So any soap that lasts. I know it's totally off topic, but I figured hey, that's yeah, good. you know by the time this airs, you know hopefully, uh, well I'm sure. Well, we know we got another month of this crap. Um, so, I mean, it's still vital information. Yeah, for sure. So, um, cool. Well, those are the top five right there. So, uh, all you guys can uh, get to work. All right. And uh, I don't know. Yeah. Got another month. So, we got more episodes coming. Uh, when this finally does air, leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. And uh, if you need us to elaborate a little bit more, just – like I said, leave a comment, like, subscribe. Let us know what we do bad. Um, let us know what we do good. Even if you hate it, tell us you hate it because uh, it boosts our ratings in uh, YouTube's comments, even if you tell us that we suck. <laughs> I think so. I don't think that anybody's going to hate this because they get to look at this phenomenal beard. Oh, that's so bad. That's so bad. I thought about it, but. Dude, just let it go, man. It's like, it's like, I mean, it's like the, I, you know, in hockey, when they get the beard going, like for the playoff run. Yeah. It's a good luck charm though, right? You don't shave it until you win this cup. Well, I'm kind of going the opposite way. I'm not shaving until we go back to work. <laughs> Just see what I got. So. All right. Well, Roy Boy standard, our top five and we're out.